I really like that opening, Jerry. I love you. That was pretty cool. So, welcome everybody. We're uh, having a good time here. Ooh, I think that's a little loud tonight. Give so. me a second. Anyway, welcome everybody. We're midway through the Latin season here. Screaming up really close to Easter, so we're uh, going to be starting off our Easter celebration here. We're getting into the planning process for that. We had orange track racing here yesterday, which was really interesting because we got to tear everything apart, set it all up, and put it all back together again. But in the process, we rearranged the back room back there. You can walk through the room now and everything. So it's, it's pretty awesome. awesome. We had 21 people here racing cars, and then we had some other people that uh, were at home and sent their cars in. So uh, went really, really well for us and everything. So we're really happy about that. That went very, very good. Uh, we're in the middle of our Bible study on Wednesday nights at seven o'clock right here. And of course that is the Overcomer series by Dr. Uh, David Jeremiah. Dr. David Jeremiah. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to remember which session we're on right now. I think we're on five. Four? Three. Not three. We just did two. Man. Wow. I, yeah, I, think I, need, I think I need coffee or something. I set my brain ahead, but it's actually in reverse. So. It's been an excellent study, and it, and it really has talked to the things that we face in our world today and, and overcoming the things in the world, evils in the world, anxiety, depression. We talked about that last week, overcoming fear in our lives and replacing fear with faith. Uh, so that's coming up here, and we just uh, think that this is so apropos in these times after going through everything that we've been through with the COVID vaccine or COVID and getting the vaccines now, so hopefully that's going to kind of normalize some things in here. And uh, then going through the derecho after that, and there's a lot of, of anxiety and there's a lot of things that we're having to deal with. And so kind of when, when we talk about these things, it leads into what Pastor Terry has picked this morning for our call to worship. And our call to worship this morning is in Romans 10, verse 17. And it says, so faith comes from hearing, and hearing from the word of Christ. And if we take a look at this, because that's got a lot of history to it, as Paul was writing this, um, God made a promise to Abraham 1,500 years before this actually was written. So you have to think about how long God had been trying to get our attention, right? And today, if we think about it, you know, how many times have we in our lives, you know, not listened to something our parents have told us? You know, we've kind of heard it, but we really didn't take it to heart. We didn't act upon it, and we didn't obey what our parents had said. And of course, there's always consequences to those actions. And so, if we take a look at this, really nothing is, is different from this passage that we find in Romans, because in here, Paul is talking about the people, and they are hearing the Word of God, but they're not receiving that Word of God, they're not taking it to heart. And so, when we look at this, it's nothing new, because the people didn't hear and obey in Abraham's time, and they didn't hear and obey in Moses' time, or in Isaiah's time, and they certainly didn't hear and obey in the time when Jesus was here with us as well. So when we think about this, it's, it's really nothing new. So in Romans here, Paul is making the point that not all will hear and respond to the word of God. And it's all historical in there. Hearing and believing produces new life, whereas if we hear and not respond, or we hear and refuse to respond to the calling of God's word and obeying God's word, it produces death, and it produces the death of the spirit. So those who don't believe, and those who don't receive it into their hearts, will not get everlasting life, as it tells us in John 3. 
So we need to realize the problem is not really with the message, but it's with the hearer of the message. Though they hear the message, they don't believe it, they don't receive it, and they don't live it out. And that's kind of the problem that we've had all along. It's kind of the same thing when we were kids. I, I read the passage from 1 Corinthians yesterday, and uh, you know, one of the passages it says, that when I was a child, I acted like a child, but as I became an adult, I left those childish ways behind. And, and kind of that's the way it is. When we're kids and we're growing up in the things, we tend to want to do what we want to do, regardless of what mom and dad has to say, or as Christians, as we're growing up in the faith, we tend to want to have our own way. We only tend to want to do the things that are convenient or that we want to respond to. And so, like that, we're like children in the spirit. As we grow in the faith and we understand that, hey, there's a reason for this stuff. God doesn't want us to go through the pitfalls of life. And if we hear and respond, receive it into our hearts and live it out, we won't have those pitfalls. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we come before you today and we praise you and thank you for this opportunity together here together and to hear your word openly and freely today. We ask that the word that you have given Pastor Terry to share with us today will, will just enliven us, let us hear it, receive it, obey it, and live it out. Lord, we just ask a blessing on him and calm his spirit as he gives your word, and Lord, just help us to obey your word on a daily basis. In your precious and holy name we pray. fun walking around here this morning. Crosses out. Got some other things up. Mark brought in his beautiful Bible. Um, there's another little surprise I know here for later. It's just it's just such a wonderful thing to be here. Yesterday as Mark said it was it was great. You know, and today we're talking about overcoming fear with faith. And as we moved in here, there was some there was some fear and trepidation that kind of fit in. It's like how will it all fit? How is it going to look? And, and we couldn't, it was hard to vision it until we came and walked in here and started moving things around. And then yesterday when we tore down, like Mark said, this whole area, you would have recognized it. <laughs> Everything was everywhere. And some of you had seen the, the office or the storeroom slash office. And it was just, it felt like it was packed full. And, and We've been going to God in prayer, and He's guiding us and He's directing us. And this morning, Diane made uh, a joke about the fact that we've been watching Tiny House Nation and paring down. She said, Yesterday, we pared down, we got rid of things that we didn't need. And so it, it, was, it was so much fun to do. And I'm so thankful that we're here. And we just get the opportunity now to worship and grow this congregation and grow ourselves spiritually so when i think about fear and we talk about fear it's both a noun and a verb so as a noun it means an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous likely to cause pain or a threat and then there's the verb is just being afraid of something or someone as it's likely to be dangerous, painful, or threatening. It's just putting it into action. And it's kind of like what we're going to be talking about faith. There's a noun and then a verb that goes with it. So fear is the reason uh, I don't like to watch scary movies or TV shows. Uh, Diane's asked me, well, oh, you haven't seen that many noun. Mm -mm. I'm not putting myself through that. I have no desire to have those three things. But yet we do. Um, think about this, uh, life has enough fear in it as it is. So we think about this past year. This has been a year. Unlike any year any of us has probably ever had. I mean, we had the flood in 08, and I know some of you were devastated by that flood, but 
it, it came and it went, and, and, we, and the city has rebuilt, and you just can't really tell. It wasn't, there wasn't any uh, lasting effects like this pandemic is going to have, because people are afraid to go out of their homes, they're afraid to do things, and I don't blame them. You know, I, I work from home, I don't get out much, and I end up, I suppose you want to go out and do something today since it's your day out of the house. But I'm not afraid to go out. I mean, I grab my mask. I've got it somewhere around here in my pocket, I think. And I just go out and I take precautions. And because I don't want to let fear dictate my life. I love it. We uh, the, the phone calls that Diana will get from her mom about the weather. <laughs> and then it's, oh, the weather's gonna be really bad. Are you staying home from work today? I'm like, mm, no, mom. <laughs> She's She's worried about the weather, but she's worried for a different reason. She's worried because of it's her daughter, and she wants her to be safe. But that's what fear can do. It can drive us to make changes. And here's the thing. Are you going to let fear prevent you from living the life that God wants you to live? Not what we want to do, but what God wants you to do and how he wants you to live. And my answer is very easy and very quick. It's, it's even shorter than the shortest verse in the Bible, which is he wept. It's just simply, no, I'm not going to let fear stop me from doing what God has called me to do. And so I want my faith to win. I want it to, to win out. I want my faith to help me do things that I never thought possible. I want to do things that that fear would have prevented me from doing. So that may, for some people, that's getting in front of others and maybe giving a message. Some pastors, they're called to the pulpit to preach messages, yet they cower in any other social situation. They just can't do it. But God helps them through it. I told Mark here a couple weeks ago when, when I was giving the message after the message, I didn't even remember what page I was on or what. I didn't realize I was at the end of the sermon when I got there. Because I wasn't talking. I was letting God do the talking. And that's what's important. We need to let God help us through things. And fear, think about this. Fear is what happened when the Israelites were going to enter into the promised land. So in Numbers 13, God has Moses send out men to explore the land he was giving them. And, and this is what it says in verses 17 through 20. Moses gave the men these instructions as he sent them out to explore the land. He said, go north through the Negev into the hill country. See what the land is like and find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Do their towns have walls or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops you see. It happened to be the season for harvesting the first ripe grapes. So they were, it's like, go out and find out these things. And, and here's the, the report they gave to Moses in verses 27 through 29. They came back and they said, we entered the land you sent us to explore. And it indeed is a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. And here's the kind of fruit it produces. But the people living there are powerful. And their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there. The descendants of Anak. The Malachites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, along the Jordan Valley. They took those questions that Moses gave them, and they gave a good report on what the country was like, and the, what the, the harvest was like, and there was plenty of that, but they cowered in front of the people. And, and this just blows my mind after watching, or after reading about what they did when they left Egypt. They saw the plagues and, and the, the things that God did to the Egyptians. Then they saw Moses, through God, part the Red Sea, and they walked through on dry ground. Yet, they aren't trusting God. They're letting fear dictate what they're going to do. And so ultimately, what did they end up doing? They became paralyzed by that fear. And that fear, and that paralyzed fear, caused them to walk around the desert for 40 years. 
Now, I think we've all been through our desert time. I've been through mine. I would much rather never go through that again. But we do that. That's what fear can do. But faith can beat that out. And think about the things that have paralyzed you with fear. What have those been? I mean, there are certain things that will happen when you're at work. It's like, uh, did I do that right? I just look up. I let God, I just give it to God and I move on. I don't have time for that. I don't have enough for that. Uh, last night, um, I went to get on our, our website and onto our OneDrive so I could get some things off of it to set things up for today. And I found out that it was all gone. Our website's gone. Our Orange Track Racing website's gone. Our emails are, are gone. Our OneDrive is gone. And I got on the phone and I spent an hour and 20 minutes on the phone with GoDaddy. And I talked to this wonderful young man named Sean. Sean did a wonderful job of reassuring me. He, he was like, boy, you're taking this pretty pretty well. Like, it is what it is. If it's gone, it's gone. There's nothing we can do about it. So getting upset's not going to do anything. And then I, I said, you know, as a pastor, I want to show people what it's supposed to be like. I wasn't fearful of losing everything. I wasn't fearful of calling Mark and going, Mark, everything's gone. <laughs> I don't know what we're But in and through this all, Sean goes, Oh, give us 24 hours. We'll have everything back. Okay. Get on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, put out everything. Hey, by the way, our website's down right now, but it'll be back soon. Fear didn't rule that. It doesn't need to. I didn't become paralyzed by it. I did try to find my, I got a new phone, so I had to find my Bluetooth headset and get a pair of them on the phone so I can walk around the house because I don't like to sit. But it was, just wasn't worth it. So when I think of fear paralyzing us, it does things like it, it, we can't move. We can't think clearly. We feel utterly powerless. And, and some of us just shut down completely. It's just like, no, nope, don't talk to me. Uh, no, I need, I need my bubble. I need to be in my own space. Just stay away. I, I can't do that right now. But what should we do? And that's where we can go back to Ephesians, where we've been in Ephesians 6, and we've been touching on the different pieces of the armor of God. And we're going to be... I love the NLT. That's my reading line. Some of the, you got to pick up some of those other verse, or, uh, translations and look through them. So Ephesians 6.16, 6, this is from the uh, English Standard Version. I love the way it says this. He says, Paul says, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil. Good morning. Good morning. And, and it goes on, you know, it's at that time. So we got to think about and, and understand the, this whole piece of, of the shield and, and the imagery that it's giving. So we, we've talked about the belt and, and the, 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 sh the uh, breastplate, but th let's talk about the sh this shield. This thing was massive. So I think two and a half feet wide, maybe about four feet tall, and they held it. And that is what helped protect them before this, even any of that body armor was affected. That shield was there. And that's what they used to block the weapons that were coming out. So when, when we hear what it says in, in verse 16 there, it says the flaming darts of the evil one, that's preventing it from even getting to that breastplate. From getting to maybe some unprotected skin on their arms. And it's so important piece of equipment that everyone had one. So the foot soldier, all the way up to the, the commanders, everybody had this shield. And just as those shields protected them, Paul is referring to the shield in this passage as a spiritual shield. One that we can prevent, use to prevent the fiery arrows or darts from Satan from getting to us. 
And, and now verse 16, you know, it's in the one we read, the flaming darts of the evil one. But here's some of the other translations. So like New King James Version calls them fiery darts of the wicked one. The NLT says fiery darts of the devil. And the New Century Version says burning arrows of the evil one. See how they're, they're kind of just sharing and uh, doing different things. And the NIV says flaming arrows of the evil one. And so it makes sense to put this in the context because that, that, that uh, shield, it was made of wood. And then it was covered in leather and it was kept top and bottom by metal. Okay? And then before they went out to battle, they dipped them in water. They got them soaking wet. That way when they held them up, and it, the, if one of those flaming arrows did come at them and it hit that, it would extinguish them right away instead of burning through it. So we have to remember that throughout the course of our lives, when we're inundated by these, these arrows, we have to put up our spiritual shield. Now, they didn't just do this by themselves, because, you know, one shield, that's all well and good. But imagine this, get, get 10 or 20 of these guys all putting their shields up, interlocked. So they overlap one another. Then you get this massive shield that's blocking. And, and that's why we talk about coming together as a, as a church family to worship on Sundays or to a Bible study on Wednesday nights or come to Orange Track Racing or moving. Just coming together as the, the children of God. And we put up that shield together and we help shield one another. Because maybe one of us can't hold our shield up as Christ. Like maybe we're going through something. But we get the others around us to help prop us up and help protect us. And it makes such a wonderful difference. And that's the only way that we can protect ourselves is through that faith. And you, you've heard us say this before. Mark and I have said this before. And, and it needs to be said again that faith is more than just believing. James 2.19 says it this way, You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the devils believe this, and they tremble in terror. Now there's a difference here. The demons believe that God is. So they believe he exists. But faith is believing in God. It takes it a step further. So is versus in. Believing in God, which is faith, goes past that, I know who he is, to submitting to and trusting in God. Faith means actively doing something. We, we talk about this all the time. We can't sit and say we believe and not let it play out in who we are. Now, I once heard someone tell me, I heard someone tell a lot of people in a speech that I'm able to separate my my religion or my faith from the decisions that I will make. I looked at the TV and went, what? No. Our faith drives every decision we make, every thought we have. And the deeper that faith, the more convicted we are about how we live our lives. Faith, Dr. Jer David Jeremiah says this about faith. He says, faith is an active practice built on belief. It, faith is not ambiguous. It's not unsure. It's concrete conviction. It's the present day confidence of a future reality. Faith is solid, unshakable confidence in God built upon the assurance that he is faithful to his promises. So faith means moving on even when the destination's not clear, even when we're not sure. We looked, and we talked about this before, we looked for two years for a place, and God kept putting up roadblocks until he said, here, this is what I have for you. Go and make disciples. And so that's what we're doing. We're, we're putting that faith into action. You know, the Israelites knew their destination. They were told they were going to the promised land. That it would be a land filled with milk and honey. That it would be a wonderful place to be. But they did not trust or submit to God. And by believing in God and in what he says, we're putting and leaning on our faith. See, in the Bible, we see time and time again that God does what he says. 
there is not one spot in the Bible, and, and if someone wants to pr prove me wrong, I dare you because you're not going to find it. God never, ever goes back on his word. He always does what he says. And he does what he says he's going to do. He promised he would take them to the promised land. Now, they disobeyed, and they had to be disciplined for it. But ultimately, they got into the promised land. The thing is, they would have done a really good job, or much better, if they had learned from their ancestors. We, we need to learn from our past. And I let that sink in, because if you think about everything that's going on in the world right now, it's been going on over and over and over. It's just cyclical. It just keeps happening. We need to learn from our ancestors. Hebrews 1.11, or 11.1, which is the beginning of, of the faith chapter in Hebrews, says this, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. See, the rest of this chapter, we're introduced to people who God made promises to. And some of them didn't see what God promised. They didn't, they didn't come to a realization of what was going to happen. Abraham, your descendants will be more numerous than the sands on the shore. Well, okay. And he kind of doubted a little bit because you know, he and, and Sarah talked about it, and then he had that he had a child that wasn't what God wanted him to do. He tried to take it and do it himself. But when he did what God wanted him to do, he and Sarah had Isaac. And and so therefore they didn't they they didn't listen. But when we listen, things happen, things go go the way that God wants them to go, and we see fruit from it. And there will be times where Satan wants us to doubt. In fact, he'll do everything in his power to cause us to doubt. And, and when he gets us to doubt, what, what does that lead to? That leads to fear. You know, I, I can think of times, and Mark and I talked about this a while back, there's a lot that goes on in a call center like where I work. And things change so quickly. It's so easy for Satan to just put his foot in the door, keep it from closing, and get us to go, I don't know what that's going to bring. Joe, another shift bid's coming around. Uh, Mark, my schedule's 2.30 to 10.30. Oh, but wait, I have Wednesdays off for Bible study, I have Saturdays off for, for outreach, and I had Sunday mornings off for church. God is good even when it was bad. It's like, okay, here we go. What we need, God, he is there. What we need to do is we take that shield of faith and we protect ourselves with it. We protect ourselves from that doubt and that fear. And if we want to overcome fear, then we need to strengthen our faith and trust in God. And I've got five strategies for you this morning to help you with that. Number one, we need to hear God's word. Okay? Our call to worship this morning is, is right from this very first strategy. Romans 10, 17, it says, So faith comes from hearing. That is, hearing the good news about Christ. So we have to hear it. Well, how do we hear it? Well, we study it daily. We pick up our Bibles. We open them up. And, and I joke, but... Get the dust off from the Bible, open it up, and read it. Take time. Do you need a Bible plan? It helps me stay on track. That's why I do a Bible plan. But what? Do I have to read all of that? Open it up, listen to what God is telling you, and then read a passage. And if He stops you on one verse, then spend your time that morning or that day on that verse. Because you're spending time with God in it. It's not about how much you read. It's about what you're reading. So if you, if you don't get that passages down for the day, don't beat yourself over That's what Satan wants. He wants you to beat yourself up over it. Spend time with God. Just enjoy it. 
and, and we need to study it with others. So that's where Wednesday nights comes in. That's where Sundays come in. That's where uh, you know other Bible studies come in. You know, we've got one gal that uh, wants to. The light gets a little bit later in the evening. She'll be coming back to Bible study. She can't die at night. But she goes, she comes here for Bible study. She goes somewhere else for another Bible study. She does something online. She watches church online. She's getting fed everywhere she can. Fantastic. That's the most important part. And so when we do that, we're going to be filled by God's word. So we'll hear it. We'll be filled by it. We can respond to it. And our faith will Grow. Number two, we understand. We need to understand that we need problems. That one sounds a little off. We have to understand that we need problems. Well, we don't let our problems rule our lives. We let them lead us to God. Now, how often do you see someone who gets all the way down, just? They hit rock bottom. They have nowhere else to turn, but they can turn to God. As we were getting ready to leave last night, and I know Mark probably prayed over this kid as well. We were getting ready to walk out the door, and the young man walked in. He could barely walk. He could barely stand up. And, and just, the, I don't know what he drank or what he injected, or but this poor kid, he couldn't understand him. At one point I thought he said he wanted a Red Bull. And then when I told him that church, it was, we were in a church, he, he started asking for the organ. So well, well, we don't have an organ. And then he just was confused. And all we could do, there was no, there's no way that we were going to be able to communicate with him. But we could pray for him. We could lift him up to God and pray that he finds God to overcome this addiction that is ultimately ruining his life. But there's other things. So think of all the things in your life that can cause problems. We've got family. So sometimes it's your spouse, sometimes it's your kids, could be the in-laws, could be the cousins, aunts, any part of that family. It could be any of it. It could be friends. It could be your job. That list is just going to go on and on and on. Each of those things will try to rule your life. Maybe not intentionally, but Satan's going to try to use them to rule your life. And we can't let it. We need to let these things lead us to God and seek His guidance. You know, they, we, Mark mentioned about divorce. And the divorce rate is well over 50%, even amongst Christians. But you know the group of people that are staying together, that are staying married? That's the couple that prays together. Now, do, I, do we need to work on our prayer life? Absolutely. Do we pray in the morning before we leave one another? We do. Do we pray before we go to bed every night? Absolutely. And of course, we pray at every meal. But are there other times that we can be praying? Yes. We can do better. But see, here's the thing. Satan wants to cause us to doubt in all the areas of our life, so he's going to find excuses why we don't do that. And when I think about doubt and this, this doubt that Satan can put in our minds, I'm reminded of Peter. Remember, it was immediately after this that Jesus insisted the disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake. This is from Matthew 14, 22 and 23. And while he sent the people home, and then after sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. And meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. And about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they prayed, God, it's a ghost! They were afraid they were letting fear in. And so this goes to the 27 through 32. It says, Jesus spoke to them once and said, Don't be afraid. He said, Take courage, I am here. Then Peter called him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water. Can you imagine? You're walking. I'm walking on the water. This is awesome. But here's the thing. 
As long as he kept his eyes focused on Jesus, he was walking on the water. But what happened as soon as he looked away? Doubt crept in, and he started to sink. And, and uh, there's a painting out there where we see Jesus reaching under the water and pulling Peter back up. Jesus, at the end of this passage, Jesus reached out and grabbed him and says, You have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? And then when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. And Jesus got to them and the wind stopped. Everything stopped. Everything went, became calm. And then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. So when we, when we give up that doubt and when we, we realize that we have problems, we need problems, God is there. We don't run to our problems. We run to God. So don't run from your problems, I should say. Let me phrase it that way. Run to God instead. And in Peter's case, don't say, focus on God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us to trust in the Lord with all our heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all you do, and He will show you which path to take. So we must fully rely on God's word and the promises He has made to us. And recognize His authority, the authority of His word, of God's word, over the supposed authority of the world. Because the world is going to tell you that it has authority over everything. And it doesn't, God does. Recognize that by seeking His will, that we are submitting to and trusting that God's that God will show us which path to take. Number three, we have to be accountable to others. You need people in your life. You need Christian brothers and sisters in your life to help you on your walk. And I hear this a lot. Oh, I can do it by myself. I don't need to go to church. I can watch it on TV from my couch. Well, right now, hey, we're glad that you can join us that way. But we'd much rather have you here in person so we can love on you. But sometimes it just isn't possible. Maybe it's because you have no transportation or you're ill or the other thing. There's reasons to watch online, but we need to have other people in our lives. And when we think of the Roman soldier's shield, it provided that needed protection. But remember what I said when they all came together and they made that much larger shield and protected everyone for the battle ahead. And in the same way, that is the protection that we get when we come together. We're made stronger together. God strengthens us through others, other Christians. Sometimes it's by their presence, other times it's by through their words. How many times have you been with another Christian and said, Oh man, this is what's going on in my life. I, I, I need somebody to tell. I need, to, I need help with this. And they've already talked to God, but God puts somebody right in front of them where they can share that. And it helps relieve that as well. So as a community, we become stronger and better protected. And in following Jesus... We do it as one group. It was never meant to be done alone. Why do you think he picked 12 disciples to start with? And number four, we need to find God's purpose for our lives and accept it. So it's easy to find his purpose for your life. It's also easy to run from it. Think Jonah. Jonah, go to Nineveh. Preach my word. No. I'm out of here. God's purpose for your life will require you to trust Him, and sometimes in very unexpected and special ways. Think, I'm driving down the road, and I'm, uh, there's a story of a guy who was driving down the road, and he would go by us, and God told him that that family needed milk. So what did he do? He went to the store, and he bought two gallons of milk, and he bought some extra groceries, and he came and he goes, I don't, you don't know who I am, but God told me that you needed this. And the husband and wife wept. They just broke down in tears because that is what they needed. Other people have been told by God to give their car to somebody. This is my car. They gave it to that person and that blessed that person because that person needed that. God's going to ask, you're going to ask God what you want or what 
he wants you to do? It's a dangerous question. Be prepared to do what God tells you he wants you to do. So, think of Jesus sending the disciples out. He would ask them to do things in unexpected and special ways as well. Mark 6, 7 through 9 says this, And he called his twelve disciples together and began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. And he told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick. No food, no traveler's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals, but not to take a change of clothes. All right, here you go. We'll see you in a few weeks. But I've got nothing to take. That's because you're going to need to fully rely on God. Fully rely on what I'm telling you to do. And that stretching of your faith, it strengthens you. And that leads us to our final point today, number five. You have to recognize that you need to grow your faith and have God's perspective. Matthew 17, 19 to 20 says this, And afterward, the disciples asked Jesus privately, Why couldn't we cast out that demon? You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth, if you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say that this mountain moved from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. So you think you can have faith? You can have it exceedingly. And you can have it with confidence, but without having a right relationship with God, our expectations of what we thought would happen quickly fizzle out. We have to rely on God. Luke 17, 5 and 6 says this, The apostles said to the Lord, Show us how to increase our faith. And the Lord answered them, If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, May you be uprooted and planted in the sea. And it would obey you. Here, Jesus had just gotten done teaching about forgiveness, and I doubt the disciples were wondering, you know, if they could do it, but how could they forgive that much? How hard do we find it to forgive others? Jesus is telling us that rely on him through it all, and we can do that. He's teaching us that even with a little bit of faith, a mustard seed, you know, a little tiny seed, not saying that we have to be fully versed on what the scriptures say. He's saying go out in faith and just do what I'm asking you to do. And in the process, hear my word. Study my word. Understand that you need me through all of your problems. And we can then move that proverbial mountain. But we have to submit and trust God to do it. We cannot let our fear have free reign on our lives. Don't let it dwell within. How many people do you know that let that fear in and they let it dwell and then they want everybody to enjoy it with them? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I don't want to enjoy that with you. I will help you get through that, that part of your life. Let us help you as, as your brothers and sisters get through that so we then you can keep your focus on him. And, and we must look at the world through God's eyes. And when we do that, we will see things from God's perspective. Because God sees the world way differently than we do. We cannot just believe that God is. We have to believe in God. Remember, is versus in. And it all starts with a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's through this kind of faith that we will have the power to overcome our fear. Let's pray. Father God, we are living in some very trying times. Each day can seem so chaotic. We struggle with the crazy times that we're living in, Father. Let us turn to you, Father. And in all this chaos, when we turn to you, calm our thoughts, calm our emotions. Let us not lean on our own understanding, but let us lean on you. Let us pray that we can see things through your eyes, Father. Let us pray that your word would bring us peace comfort and wisdom. And Father, we know that it is by faith in you that we can overcome fear with faith.
Pastor Terry for that message. It was wonderful to hear those things again. When we come to these times in our lives and we are out faced with the world, it can overcome us, it can overwhelm us at times. And it's good to be whelmed, but it's not really good to be overwhelmed. And that's where your faith comes in, because if you have a good, solid faith, and if you have a good understanding of God's Word, it'll overcome that, because in the Scriptures it tells us not to fear. Don't fear the world, because, lo, I have overcome the world. He's overcome those things that cause us fear. So as we come to this time in our service in here, we come to our time of communion. And if you need communion cup or anything this morning, please uh, raise your hand. We'll get one over to you. And, and if not, uh, we'll go ahead and proceed through. So, uh, I want to kind of expand on those kind of things when we're talking about God overcoming the world. Because when Christ went to the cross, he overcame the world. He took on the sins of man. He took on all of the wrongdoings. He took on all of those things. All the things of the world that come against us. He took them on himself. He became fully flesh. He became fully human. Took on all those sins. All the problems of the world. And then by his death and resurrection, he overcame all of those problems. So as we think about those times and we think about that, in our time of communion this morning, we want to remember that he has overcome the world by his death and resurrection on the cross. So on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. And by being broken, it means that he took on those sins of the world. He broke himself down. He became fully human and took on those sins of the world. That's what this represents. Later on in the meal, he took the cup and he filled the cup. And after he blessed it, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And his, by shedding his blood, he overcame sins of the world. So as we take our communion this morning, we want to remember those two things, that he became fully human and took on the sins of the world. The body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. Anybody have any God sightings this morning that they'd like to talk about, or any prayers that you'd like to be to pray for? Well, what about the weather? It was beautiful yesterday, wasn't it? God gives us beautiful weather. He goes from super cold to super no warm, <laughs> and, and he's just amazing. Um, and since St. Patty's Day is coming up this Wednesday, I thought I would uh, read a prayer from um, St. Patrick, who was a fifth century. Uh, Christian missionary, and uh, he was known as an apostle of Ireland, and this is just one of his prayers, and I just thought it was pretty neat. So, Christ is with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ.
Christ when I sit down. Christ when I rise up. Christ in every man who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in everyone that sees me. Christ in every ear that hears me. Wouldn't that be a blessing to actually know that, that, that God is with us each and every day. And he is always with us and he surrounds us like in a bubble. And we know that by his word. So let us pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. Your word of the spirit that binds us with you daily. And I just uh, pray that people will reach out and, and open your Bible and read your word so that they can feel your presence in them daily. For it is such an awesome feeling. I never want to let go of that feeling. Thank you, Jesus, for your love, your kindness, your grace, and your mercies each and every day. So as we prepare to end this part of our service, I'm going to end with this passage from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of any change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. This is a wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold through your faith or though your faith is far more precious than mere gold so when your faith remains strong through many trials it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world pray with me Lord when we have days that we are scared worried anxious and don't know what is going to happen or what we're going to do remind us that you are there Hold us up through each of those trials, Father. Remind us that we are loved. Help us to trust in you each and every day. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the free gift of salvation that you give us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you for joining us. For those of you online, uh, we're going to be putting up the playlist so that you can enjoy the music that's out there that we're going to be singing this morning. And we invite you to join us again next week online or on campus. We'd love to have you join us in our new space. Thank you.